like to speak to us this morning from the theme, there's some Judas in all of us. My text this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 16 through 22, where we find uh, these words. Concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out and among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. I think that this is a fascinating story. And it's, it's a fascinating story to be told at the outset of this very important book. This book is known to us as the Acts of the Apostles. This book tells the story of how after Jesus' death and resurrection, God's plan for humanity would now be carried out, not through Jesus directly, but by the church empowered with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that sounds a lot like Pentecost, but this story is kind of a warm-up to Pentecost. Before they got to Pentecost, they had to get their leadership in order. And apparently, there was a problem with their leadership. Jesus had handpicked 12 of the disciples to be leaders of the church, handpicked by Jesus. Jesus himself interviewed all of them, and still he picked Judas. He picked Judas who would become a traitor to him. Judas was the one who set up Jesus to be killed. He set him up in exchange for a bribe from the police. Wow. So the early church is presented with the dilemma of replacing Judas so that there would be 12 disciples to govern the church. Now, this was, of course, a kind of a numerology. Since there were 12 tribes of Judah, there had to be 12 apostles for the church. And believe it or not, there's 12 people in this congregation. <laughs> hey, it's one of God there. But what, what I find fascinating about this passage that is relevant for our church today are three things. One, how does the church go on after a tragedy? Two, how does the church choose new leadership, especially after a tragedy? And three, how does the new leader lead a wounded church? Churches experience a variety of tragedies. Sometimes the source is in the pews. Sometimes the source is in the pulpit. In the previous church I served, we had the source in our pews. 
our church experienced an embezzlement by a lay officer of over $70,000. And it tore the church up to recognize and to realize that, that someone who'd been a part of the church for 20 years, who had grown up in the church and had been elected to an office of trust, had betrayed those people who taught her in Sunday school and went with her on youth trips and served with her in the church. Now understand this, that wasn't the first church to suffer an embezzlement and it's not the last. Other churches have experienced tragedy that came from the pulpit. I don't need to recite them for you. The stories are legion. From lecherous televangelists to corrupt and incompetent pastors that you've never even heard of. This is a touchy subject. But every now and then, we need to touch it. Ministers, bona fide, called by God, called by the church, and having rendered good service, still fail, still betray, still fall. And so whatever the source, pulpit or pew, the church has a mission that is larger than its misery. And it requires that the church face the reality that we are not in heaven yet. And that there's some Judas in all of us. Now, the problem with the way the traditional church has handled Judas is that we have scapegoated Judas. Judas is the ultimate scapegoat. We put all the evil, all the human failure, all the human frailty on Judas and then send him out and feeling that we are now purged and we who remain are pure. But we must recognize that the symbol of Judas is meant to be a mirror to the church. The figure of Judas is to remind us that when we lose sight of the mission and start to put ourselves and our personal interests ahead of the interests of the mission and ministry of the church, we are vulnerable to betraying the faith we hold and the church we love. This is why there must be accountability for the pew and accountability for the pulpit. And where there is no accountability, that church, that ministry is ripe for corruption. But there is an opportunity in the message of Judas' story. While the legend suggests that Judas committed suicide, we each and we all have the chance to write a new ending to our own stories. Rather than commit suicide, and I mean that also figuratively, sometimes when people in the pew fail the church, they get embarrassed and they leave. Sometimes when ministers fail the church, they get humiliated and they leave. But rather than commit suicide, rather than abandon your ministry, rather than abandoning your church, what if we take the Judas in us and we repent? If we repent, then the church that we betrayed 
Then the church is confronted with the question, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus have done if Judas had come back before the crucifixion and repented? It's, it's somewhat clear from the story that his impulse almost immediately was one of great regret. But what if he had gone to Jesus and said, I'm so sorry that I lost sight of the mission just long enough to betray you and now look where we are. I believe that Jesus would have received him and restored him. But we don't have the faith to believe that if we will repent, that we will be, that we can be restored. We just walk away. We just abandon whatever that circumstance is. And it's not only what happens in our churches, it's what happens in our lives. We just walk away, run away. But if we have the faith to believe that if we repent, we will be and can be restored, I think we'll be surprised. Try it. You might like it. There is nothing stronger than a relationship that has been broken and healed. There is nothing stronger than a relationship that has been broken and healed. There is nothing stronger than a church that has been broken and healed. The church that's never been broken and healed will always wonder if they're strong enough. They will always wonder, do we really have what it takes to make it through a tough time? But when you've been through a tough time and you have made it through to the other side, when the next difficulty comes, your soul looks back and wonders and remembers how I got over. You say, oh, I've been here before. I know I can make it through. And you bear down and you burrow through and you make it to the other side. So don't give up on your Judas. Give them a chance to be redeemed. The early church faced the tragedy of Judas and called one, or actually they, they called two, two of those who had been with them from the beginning. It says they found among those who had been with Jesus throughout the entire ministry two qualified persons, and they stood them up before the congregation, and when they got down to the last decision, it says that they cast lots to see who would be the apostle. Now, this was one of those old ancient practices of, it's, just, it's kind of like reading tea leaves. Literally, they, they cast lots to choose who would become the apostle. I mean, if, if we were to do it, it would be something like you just, okay, uh, uh, Reg, stand up. Judy, stand up. Now, I'm going to leave one day, and somebody has to become the pastor. So let's, let's just flip the coin. Right, heads is Reg and tails is Judy. They flipped a coin, and that was their way of making some room for God. That was their way of saying our human intellect and knowledge and insight and judgment can only get us so far, and we can go as far as we can, and then we've got to leave some space for God. Even today, in the Coptic church in Egypt, when they elect their pope, they still cast lots. They still find three final candidates 
that they choose among all the bishops of the church. And then at the very end, they put those three names in a box and they take a blindfolded altar boy who comes up, reaches in the box and pulls out a name. We don't, we don't do that. We don't do it like that in our tradition. In our congregational tradition, our search committees choose one person for the congregation to vote up or down. Maybe we should narrow it down to two finalists and then flip a coin next time. When you judge the uh, record of some churches, they might have done better to do it that way. And so you have to choose a new leader to go on. Well, I stand here today with great, great humility and satisfaction and joy because I'm glad that you didn't flip a coin on me. I'm glad that you chose me and that I can stand here on this day, this third Sunday of May, exactly 17 years since I first stood in this pulpit as pastor of Pilgrim United Church of Christ. So thank you for 17, 17 years. You, are, you all have come and gone two or three times on your assignments to the Pentagon and 29 Palms and back to in 17, and I'm still here. <laughs> yes, amen. And yes, Pilgrim was a healthy church when I arrived. And Pilgrim had been through some things when I arrived. In fact, I think somebody told me that there was a leadership crisis right before I arrived. But the church went on. The church healed. And you know, church, the pilgrim was a healthy church when I arrived, and it allowed us to face and survive and ultimately thrive as we do today. Now, since I've been here, our first major test was our safe church crisis of 2007. And we'll hear more about that next week on our safe church Sunday. Because one of the ways that we've decided to heal is to not forget, to not sweep it under the rug. And so every year we recognize safe church Sunday to talk about what we have done and what we are doing to make sure that all vulnerable people within our congregation are safe to be here. More about that next week. Jaime Roman will be leading us as our Minister for Healing and Healthy Environments. Our second major test was the pandemic of 2020. And we are now about about to emerge from that crisis as a strong and vital church. We are ready to hit the ground running when we come back in person in late June or early July. By that time, we will have had all of our quirks worked out. By that time, we'll have all of our technical problems worked out. By that time, maybe we'll even have our lighting worked out so people can see me on camera. Bill, please remind me not to wear black anymore. <laughs> now you all are here, but I'm watching the monitor of our Zoom broadcast and I just, you know, the lighting was all right when you were on screen, Karen. And then I got up here and it was too late, <laughs> too late. Anyway, we'll have it all worked out so that we have a wonderful and spiritual experience for those who are present and a wonderful and spiritual experience for those of you who are at Pajama Church. We are emerging from this pandemic, I think stronger in many ways. We forward with this new feature to our church 
an online ministry of Zoom and Facebook Live. We will emerge and go on as a stronger church because we have a new staff person, the Reverend Adrian Arms, as our online minister, minister for online ministries. We are ready to do the work of anti-racism and we are beginning our interracial partnership with St. John Baptist Church and Walker Chapel AME Church, both in Oceanside, both African-American congregations. We are ready to do the work of reparations. And many of you are willing and, and even anxious to make personal contributions of reparations in addition to working to make our government accountable for the 400 years of white supremacy and black exploitation that have made this nation the wealthiest human history has ever known. We are ready to fight for immigration reform that treats all of God's children like human beings entitled to their share of the earth's bounty. We are emerging from this pandemic ready to fight for women's equal rights and rights of bodily autonomy. We are ready to fight for the pride and dignity of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans folks that are both in our church and in the world. Yes, they are everywhere in our world. Yes, God has blessed us to be a strong, courageous congregation that eats adversity for breakfast. I thank God for Pilgrim Church. And I am thrilled to be part of a congregation as committed, as progressive, as loving, and as joyful, and yes, as filled with the Holy Spirit as our Pilgrim United Church of Christ. God bless you. Let the people of God say, Amen.